Now, in the book of Jeremiah here, chapter 42, we're going to spend quite a bit of time, 42, 43, and 44. I want to cover this story that's happening in the book of Jeremiah. And what I want to point your attention to right in the very beginning of the, of the chapter, what these people say. Look at what it says in, uh, let's start in verse 1. We're going to reread this just a little bit. Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Korea, and Jezaniah the son of Oshiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near him, and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us. So, so first, what's happening is, you know, Jeremiah is a prophet. He's a man of God. And up to this point, I mean, this is 40 chapters deep into the book of Jeremiah. A lot of bad things have happened to the children of Israel. They've had, they've had you know, the, the king of Babylon has come, and they've taken a lot of them captive. And see, they've already been receiving word from the Lord. They've already had preachers tell them, look, you know, don't fight them. Don't go to war with them. This is God's judgment is coming upon you. And they didn't want to listen. They didn't want to hear it. They fought. They got slaughtered. They got taken away captive. You know, all these bad things happened. And now we're seeing again. So now these people are going to Jeremiah and saying, okay, look, pray for us unto the Lord. You know, pray for us. And it says in, um, in verse 3, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein may, we may walk and the thing that we may do. So saying, look, we want to know what we're supposed to do now. Okay. Basically, we screwed up before, but, but pray unto God for us and tell us what are we supposed to do? What, what, what is it that, that God wants us to do? Which way should we walk? Verse 4 says, Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Now, this is the exact type of preacher that you want to be listening to. This is the, this is the type of pastor, this is the type of preacher that, I mean, he says he's going he's gonna to go to the Lord. Whatever God's answer is, he says, I'm going to tell it to you, and I'm not going to hold anything back. See, a lot these days, what a lot of preachers are doing, they're holding back the message. They're trimming the message. And the reason being is because when it's a negative message, when it's a negative, uh, you know, um, when it's a negative message from the Lord, people don't like to hear that. It's not, it's not received very well, usually, when something negative is coming across. And this is exactly what's, I mean, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah is like almost all negative, right? There's all kinds of bad things happening, but it's a result of the, of the, of the children of Israel's sin. It's not, it's not anyone else's fault. It's their own fault. But see, there's a lot of bad things that are happening. So when you look at like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, it's just filled with all of this, this preaching. And they're great books. They're real long books of the Bible. But um, it's, just, it's just tons of just negative message and negative preaching. But thank God for people like Jeremiah who say, I'm going to keep nothing back from you. Because you know what? Even though something might be a negative message, you know, usually if it's the truth, you're going to need to hear it. Right? If you really want to know what God has for you, maybe it is going to be negative. Maybe it's not going to be pleasant, but it's going to be needful for you. And ultimately, in the end, it's going to make it, it will bring forth a joy. It will be a positive. It really is a positive message in the end, but it's just not in the short term. But see, we live in a society where people just, they want to be instantly gratified. They want to live for the short term. They want everything to be good right now in this moment. They don't want to go through any hardships. They don't want to go through any trials. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to do anything like that. They don't want to obey God's commandments. They just want everything to be right. So what they do is they get teachers under themselves, having itching ears that's just going to tickle their ears and say, everything is great. Keep doing what you're doing. God's okay with your sin. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing. Keep loving God and just living and living life, and you're going to be just fine. And this is the message that most people want to hear today. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, preachers who, who will preach the whole counsel of God that won't hold anything back. You know, sometimes their churches don't grow very much, and a lot of people, will, you know, people come and visit, and then they won't come back again because they don't like hearing the message. Now, it's not always a negative message. Um, you know, anyone who's been coming here for a while realizes that we have positive, we have negative, and there's both in the Bible. But the thing is, I'm not going to just be a positive only preacher. I'm not only going to preach on the good things that are just nice to hear, that's just always going to put you in a good mood when you leave this place, because you know what? That's not going to help you. 
I need to, to keep nothing back from you. Everything that's written in this book, every word of God is pure. Every word of God is true. And we can learn from all of it. And we constantly need to be growing and, and improving our lives, getting sin out of our life, and just and, and moving forward and, and just growing in our Christian life. Verse number five says, Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not, even according to all things, for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Now this is a bold statement. They're saying, okay, look, God's witness. Whatever you come back to us with, whatever it is that God says, we're going to do it. We're going to listen. God's not, God is to let God be our witness right now. We're telling you, when you come back to us and tell us what God has for us, God's our witness. Look at verse number six. It says, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God. Now, is that what they should be saying? Absolutely, that's what they should be saying. But the problem is, as we're going to see here when we get into chapter 43, that's not what their heart was saying. That's what their lips were saying. They were giving lip service to God. They were saying, oh yeah, whatever, whatever it is God wants us to do, we're going to do it. And unfortunately, that's exactly what's going on in Christianity today. You see, Oftentimes, this will represent the crowd that comes in. They'll come into church on Sunday, and they'll talk the talk, right? And they'll look really good. They'll sing the songs. They'll say, you know, they love God. But then when they get home, they just forget God. They just, it's right back to just doing, living in the world, doing everything, not worried about their sin, not worried about their growth with God, not even thinking about God. It's just right back to just their daily lives, daily routine. has nothing to do with God. And what happens is, you know, and, and this is, it's hypocrisy. And it's destroying Christianity when people don't have, when you don't have a heart to serve God, it doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth. And actually, it does, it does matter in this sense. You shouldn't be charging, the, you know, making statements foolishly and making vows foolishly. I mean, these people said, they were, they were saying, as God is our witness, whether it's good or whether it's evil, we're going to obey God. Don't say something like that unless you're prepared to follow through with it. Okay, don't open up your lips. Don't speak foolishly because God's going to hold you accountable for that. And God holds these people accountable for that. They say, look, it's great. You want to come in here? You want to hear what the Bible has for you? Well, check your heart today because what comes across, if you get rebuked, if you get told you're wrong, how are you going to receive that? See, these people, they had a, a premeditated idea in their heads of what they wanted God to say to them. And it didn't line up with what Jeremiah said. So when before they hear what Jeremiah is saying, they're already thinking, well, yeah, we're going to obey everything that God says for us because they're all only thinking it's going to be one thing. They're going to be thinking God's going to tell them, yeah, go into Egypt and you'll be safe there and God will protect you there. That's what they wanted to hear. But we find out here in chapter 43 that um, that's, not, that's not what they do at all. They basically just call Jeremiah a liar and say, well, that's not what God said. Right after they get done saying, hey, anything that you tell us, whatever God says to do, that's what we're going to do. And then he tells them, he tells them the truth, he doesn't hold anything back, and they're like, yeah, God didn't say that. You see, with their hearts, they weren't ready to receive whatever it truly was that God had for them. They just already had it set in their mind, set in their heart, this is what we're going to do, this is what I want to do, and, I, it doesn't, and ultimately it doesn't matter what God says or thinks, this is just the way that I'm going. And see, they gave lip service to God. A lot of people do that these days. A lot of people will say, oh yeah, I serve God. Yeah, I love God. I'm going to do whatever he, whatever the Bible says for me to do, that's what I'm going to do. But then when, when you preach and say, you know, you're not even supposed to look upon alcohol, look not on the wine when it's red, people will be like, well, no, because they, they already have a preconceived idea. They already love to drink or they already, you know, don't want to think that that's true. They already have it established in their mind. Well, no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just fine. They don't receive God's word. See, you have to have a heart that's ready to receive. You have to be able to receive rebuke, receive chastening from the Lord in order to grow and not to be stiff-necked and just to be thinking that you can't change that, um, you know, when God's telling you his truth and from, from the word. And see, a lot of times people will label you when you honestly do have the heart where you say, you know what? Whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. And when you actually mean it from your heart and you start living that way, people in, in the world are going to tell you, oh yeah, you're labeled a legalist, right? You're such a legalist. 
Because you actually literally believe what the Bible says. And people try telling you like, oh, you believe in all those rules because they love their sin. And that's why there's, there's, there's a prevalent notion of, you know, oh, you know, we're all sinners and Jesus Christ came and he got rid of the law. So we're just free in Christ and everything's fine and we're happy. And, and yeah, we're sinners, but it's not that big of a deal because Jesus paid for them. It's like, well, no, it absolutely is a big deal. God has commandments for a reason. They're not suggestions. It's not just, well, this is kind of the way I'd like you to live your life. No, they're commandments. God commands us to live a certain way. And when we break those commandments, it's sin. And it's treated very seriously. And you're just trotting underfoot Jesus Christ's blood if you think it's just not that big of a deal. Jesus Christ shed his blood because of your sins, because you were wicked, because you did what was wrong. You're not given the proper respect unto Jesus Christ. We say, oh, we're just free and grace. See, Jesus Christ has abolished the law. No, he didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled the law. There's a big difference. He didn't abolish it. Okay? Without the law, there's no sin. And people are still sinners today because the law is still in effect. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to obey the law perfectly to get to heaven. Jesus Christ paid that gift for us. But it ought, we ought to have that respect to him and what he did for us and the shed blood that he had for us and his dying and raising again from the dead. Everything that he did to pay for our sins, not to just treat it as like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. It's a huge deal. And that just shows your lack of respect for Jesus Christ when you think that your sin is not a big deal. And we don't want to face it just because of your own wickedness and your own wicked heart to cling unto your own sins. <clears throat> people will label you legalist or they'll think that you're just some radical. I mean, people will think that, that us today are radical because we don't watch TV, we don't go out to the movies, you know, um, we don't listen to the world's music. We, you know, there's all these different things that we do. And I'm not trying to exalt ourselves. I'm just saying it's that we recognize, hey, this stuff is wickedness. Hey, we don't want to be brainwashed into the way of thinking of the world. Hey, we don't want to look upon sin and just be entertained by sin. This is not what we want to do with our life. But people look at you and be like, you're crazy. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. It wouldn't be, you know, God's commandments wouldn't be in the Bible if it wasn't a big deal. Jeremiah was a real preacher. He's truly a man of God. And we're going to see how these people react when their heart is not right. And, and this is what this is the whole point. This is what I want you thinking about today. We're going to go over this story. We're going to see how these people react. But the whole point of this, and be thinking about this through a sermon, is how is your heart with God? How is your heart when you get rebuked? How is your heart when you see something from the Bible? How do you receive it? Are you humble? Are you meek? Do you accept it and say, Wow. Maybe I didn't realize this before, but this is what God is saying. This is what the Bible is saying. And you know what? I was wrong. And I'm going to change. I'm going to do what's right. Or are you going to have the attitude that just says the, the, the instinct or the reaction that just you just go right at odds and you just go right into fighting and say, you know, because this happens to a lot of people. You get rebuked. A lot of times people's first instinct is just to defend themselves and just say, well, I'm, wrong. I'm, not, wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. Is that the type of reaction you're going to have when God rebukes you? When, when you see something in the Bible that says you're supposed to act a certain way, you're supposed to behave a certain way, you're not supposed to do certain things, are you just going to say, well, no, it's okay? Or are you going to receive it? And this is just what I want you thinking of because we're going to see what these people do and, and, and how wicked they were. Look at uh, chapter 43 now. Because they all they just got done saying, whatever God says, we're going to do it, right? Jeremiah tells them, and he says, don't rely on Egypt. And here's the thing. Here's another. I'm going to point this out, too, because I didn't have it in my notes. But um, the problem is that sometimes when God tells you to do something, it's not always going to be easy. Look at verse 14 of chapter 42. We're going to go back to verse four, or chapter 42 real quick. Look at verse number 14 or 13. It says, But if ye say, We will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. So he's saying, Look, if you take the easy way out, you know, because that's what they're thinking. Their, their whole thought process is, you know, if they stay in the land, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a struggle. I mean, they just got decimated. They got destroyed. They have no real defenses. 
right? They have no earthly physical defenses, but God's saying, look, if you stay here, I'm going to plant you. I'm going to build you. God wants them to have faith in him. God is able to protect them. God is able to see them through the hard times. Now, are they going to be, you know, maybe going through some times of hunger? Are they going to go through some struggles? Absolutely. Okay, but that is what God has for them to do. That was the word of the God. It was not just a cakewalk. God was not just making it easy on them, but he's saying, look, I want you to believe me. I want you to obey me. And that's ultimately what God wants us to do. He just wants our obedience. He's not looking for some extra special sacrifices. He's not asking for much. He's just saying, look, just the word that I say unto you, I just want you to obey it. Just obey what I have for you. It might not always be easy, but see, what they want to do, they want to take the easy way out. They think, in their, see, in their minds, they're not thinking about the Bible, they're not thinking about God. They're just thinking physically and earthly, just thinking that, hey, if we go into Egypt, we're going to be away from the war. You know, Egypt is a, like at that time, Egypt was a strong nation. They have defenses. We're not going to have to worry about the Babylonians anymore. Everything will be just fine. They have food and bread. You know, there's, there's none of these plagues came on Egypt like they came upon us. The pestilence, the famine, all these things. We're going to escape from all that if we just go into Egypt. And that's what they had in their minds. And that's what they were thinking about when they told Jeremiah to go to God and ask him. They just wanted to get confirmed that that was the right way to do it. And when Jeremiah came back with a different answer, in their hearts, they already had it settled. They already said, no, we're going into Egypt. We're going to go there where it's easy. And I like what Jeremiah told him because he warns them. He says, look, if you're going to take the easy way out, if you think that you're going to escape all this stuff, if you think you're going to escape the judgment of God when you disobey him, if you think you can just run away and go somewhere else and God's judgment is not going to come out of you, he said, you got another thing coming. Look at verse number 16 or 15. It says, and now therefore hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine where ye were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. So he's saying, look, you, you know, the stuff that you're afraid of, the stuff that you don't want to face, the stuff that you don't want to go through, God's going to make sure you go through it anyways. And there you're going to actually die. And there it's, you're, you're not going to be, you know, he's not going to come and help you. If you would have just stayed in the land, it might have been a little bit difficult, but he would have seen you through it. He wasn't going to kill you. He was going to plant you down and that you were going to grow and build up the nation again. But they decided, no, we're going to go back into Egypt. Now look at chapter 43. Because we're going to see their response here. I've been telling you what it is, but we're going to see exactly what they say. Chapter 43, look at verse number 1. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Korea. Now notice, Johanan the son of Korea is the exact same Johanan in verse 1 of chapter 42 that just asked Jeremiah to go and speak to him. So then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Korea, verse 2, and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. So the same guy that says, Jeremiah, we want you to ask God, hey, whatever he says we're going to do, the same exact guy is saying, You're lying. You speak falsely. God didn't tell you to tell us not to go into Egypt. Look at verse number three. It says, But Barak, the son of Neriah, setteth thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death, and carry us away captives into Babylon. So Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces, and all the people, obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. Their response to, to, to just call Jeremiah a liar, and just say, that's not what God said, this is a typical response. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay, and this is exactly what people will do today. People will say, the Bible doesn't tell you that you're supposed to spank your children. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that, that women can't be pastors and, and, ruling, and running a church. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere when it does in both cases. The Bible says, thou shalt beat them with the rod and shalt deliver their soul from hell, the book of Proverbs. And the Bible says that uh, let the woman learn in silence. Okay. These are words from the Bible. These are words from God that are given to us. Yet people will just say, oh yeah, the Bible doesn't say that. 
and then just basically call God a liar. That's what they're doing with Jeremiah. They're calling Jeremiah a liar, but Jeremiah had the words of God. They're calling God a liar. Or when people say, well, God doesn't care how long my hair is, he dedicated like an, uh, an entire chapter there, half a chapter just to that one subject. Okay, people just, just respond and just say, oh, well, the Bible doesn't say that. That's not what the Bible's talking about. It's just a quick answer because they don't like the message. They don't like what it says. See, there's a big difference in just being able to receive what it says and just look at it and be like, oh, okay, well, that's what the Bible says, so I'm just going to believe it. Whereas people just already have their mind made up about us, whatever the subject is. I mean, I just listed, through, listed three things that are real common today for people to just stiffen their neck and say, I don't want to hear what God has to say because I already have my own ideas. I'm not going to, I don't care what the Bible says. I already have it made up in my mind. Now, it's also interesting to note here, too, that they place the blame on Barak, the son of Neriah, in verse 3. It says, but Barak, when they were talking to, to Jeremiah in verse 2, they said, Thou speakest falsely, the Lord God, not sent thee to say, Go down to Egypt to sojourn there. But Barak, the son of Neriah, set it beyond against us. So now they're saying that it wasn't... Um, They're saying that it wasn't Jeremiah necessarily who's deceiving them. They're putting the blame now on Barak. And they're saying, oh, Barak's the one that told you to, to, to tell us not to go into Egypt. Now, it's kind of interesting here because Barak, just so you know, Barak the son of Uriah, he was actually the messenger for Jeremiah. He wasn't the one pulling the strings. He wasn't the one telling Jeremiah what to do. Jeremiah was the one telling him what to do. He was the scribe. He was the one that when... Um, you know, Jeremiah was in prison, Jer and, and he had he was locked up. He had Barak record all the words of the message from the Lord. He had him write it in a scroll and deliver the message to people. So Barak was working for Jeremiah in that sense. He was a scribe. But these people are saying, oh yeah, Barak, he's the one that's, that's telling you to do this. And I don't understand why people do this, but it's like they, they can't accept that a certain person maybe just actually believes the word of the Lord. And this happens, I see this, we, we see this personally. It's, it's funny because like, like my wife's family, after, you know, after we got married and everything, she believes the Bible, okay? She decided that on her own. Now, did I have an influence in that? Sure I did. You know, I'm the one that started bringing her to church. But she got saved and she, she has formed her own beliefs. Now, have we always agreed on everything? No. Of course not. She has her own beliefs because they're her beliefs. Yet, it's interesting that like, <laughs> if she's talking to her family or something comes up or that, you know, things that they don't like and, and they're not saved, you know, so, you know, especially the world, they're going to look at this and they're going to think we're nuts. They're going to think we're crazy. They don't understand. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand what's going on. But it's interesting because what they do then is that they'll just like the blame just gets shifted on me. Like, even though she believes these things, it's just like, well, well I'm the one that's wrong. You know, it's, it's, I, it's my fault. It's, it's, all, it's all on me. She doesn't really believe that, but she's just saying that because of me. And, and, and it's the same way, you know, it's the same exact way with me and my family, where, like, my family will think, well, it's not really me. It's, it's my former pastor. He's the reason. You know, he's the bad guy. And, and it's, it's just, it's just kind of interesting because you see the same exact thing here where people just, they just kind of want, maybe they like somebody. Like, maybe they like Jeremiah as a person, but they're, just, so they're saying, like, without just completely, just blatantly calling him a liar, which they did, they're saying, well, but we know it's like Barak's fault. You know, it's not necessarily your fault. Barak's the one that's, that's telling you to do this. You know, and kind of shifting the blame and, and, and putting it off on him. And that's, the, and that's ultimately what it is. It's just a blame game. I mean, people don't want to recognize their own sin, so what they do is they try to justify it. And they'll just try to put the blame off anywhere it could possibly go other than themselves. That's exactly what it is. It's just, they don't want to confront the fact that it's just God's word. Okay, it's not a person, it's not about an individual, it's not about me, it's not about my wife, it's not about my pastor, it's not about anybody else. It's about God's word. Okay, and people that don't like God's word, people that don't want to hear God's word, people that respond poorly, whose heart is not right to receive rebuke or chastening from the Lord, they're going to make up excuses. They're going to make up excuses for their sin. They're going to say, oh, it's not that bad. And they're going to put the blame off on somebody else and just, and just say, oh, well, you're just lying. That's not really what the Bible says. Just to make an excuse to make it okay that what they're doing really isn't that bad. 
Now let's continue looking here. And, um, we're going to go to chapter 44. Because basically in 43, they disobey. They go into Egypt. They already had it made up. We're going to go into Egypt. You lied to us. So that's what they do. They go, to, they go into Egypt. Now we're going to see the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah again in, um, in chapter 44. Look at verse number 2. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Ye have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolation, and no man dwelleth therein, because of their wickedness which they have committed to provoke me to anger, and that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. So he's saying, look at all the evil I brought upon Jerusalem. Look at everything I did to this place. Because... They, they went, they served other gods, and they just wouldn't listen. They wouldn't hearken. Verse number four. Howbeit I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. So here's the thing. God's trying to get through to these people. <coughs> He's sending his servants, servants. He's sending the prophets. He has preachers. These people have preachers that are preaching to him and saying, Look, thus saith the Lord. Don't go in Egypt. Don't do so abominably. Follow the Lord your God. And, and they're warning him. They're doing their jobs. They're saying, look, if you disobey God, you know, God's going to bring evil upon you. They warn them, yet they don't want to listen. Verse number five, but they hearkened not. It means they didn't listen. They didn't listen to him, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense unto other God. Verse six, wherefore, that means because of this, my fury and my anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate at this time. Don't think that God has changed today. When you have a man of God, when you have a preacher standing up, and he's preaching about God, and he's preaching about the Bible, and he's preaching about the judgment of God, and telling you, hey, look, these are some commandments. God doesn't want you doing this in your life. Look what happens to the people. He says his fury and his anger is going to be poured forth. When you just deliberately, you can hear God's word and you don't want to have anything to do with it. You want to just stick to your sin. God's anger, God's wrath is going to be poured forth. Okay, God will rebuke. God will chasten. And he's not going to, you, you can't run away from God. You can't hide from him. They thought they could run and hide in Egypt. That was foolishness. You can't run and hide from God. Look at verse number seven. It says, therefore now thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling out of Judah to leave you none to remain in that ye provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt, whither ye be gone to dwell that ye might cut yourselves off and that ye might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Have ye forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives? which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. He's pleading with the people saying, look, how can you not see this? You know, God's judgment has come. You forget all the wickedness that was done and all the judgment that's come as a result of that. And you continue to refuse to obey. You continue to just live in your sin. You continue to burn incense on other gods. The biggest problem here that I see with them is that they're proud. We already saw it earlier in chapter 43, verse 2. It says, Then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and jo Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the proud men, saying that in Jeremiah, thou speakest falsely. In chapter 42, it says, look, they were proud. Saying, Jeremiah, you're a liar. They were lifted up in their own hearts. Look at verse number 10 of chapter 44, where we just were. Chapter 44, it says, They are not humbled. Even unto this day, neither have they feared, nor walk in my law, nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Now, this is, this is interesting that these people were still not even humbled at this point. A lot of people, in order to come to God, need to be humble. And for some people, it takes a lot more bad things to happen in their life than others. Some people, they don't need to go through all of the, the, the pain and suffering and sorrow that, that sin will bring in your life and that disobeying God will bring. Some people can just can recognize that and not have to go, all, go through all that stuff and still be able to humble themselves. But see, most people, I think, and this is one of the reasons why I believe that soul winning, um, a lot more people get saved in like poorer areas and poorer communities. 
Because when you're going through hard times, when you're going through struggles, when you have a lot of things that are going on in your life, you're a lot more likely to look to God for answers and then just look to God for some help. And you become humble when you're not able to do things on your own. And that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to get people saved in richer areas because they got everything going for them. What do they need God for? I, I work hard. Hey, I've got, I've got myself settled. i got myself established. I did it all on my own. That's what they think. That's what they foolishly think. They're not humble. And we need to have humble hearts in order to receive God's rebuke, in order to receive his correction. Now, these people, the children of Israel, they went through a lot. They were decimated. I mean, they, 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 they came in. People were taken captive. Tons of people were killed. They had pestilence, famine. All of these bad things are happening. They're not in, good, in a good state by any means. And they're still not humbled. It says, even unto this day. And they just, they want to take the easy way out. They had, a, they had proud hearts. Let's skip down to verse number 15 in chapter 44. Continue on with this story. It says, then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. That's that stiff neck. They just they don't want us. They say, we, we heard what you said. We're not going to listen. We're not going to obey. We're, not gonna, we're just not going to do what you said. Verse 17, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. To burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of vittles and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. We have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Now, there's so many things I want to point out, and I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to all of them. Man, there's no way I'm going to get to all of them. But the first thing I want to point out here is they were worshiping the queen of heaven. Okay, it specifically mentions that twice. It said they're worshiping the queen of heaven. And I believe this is, this is still going on today. And in modern day, it's the Catholic religion. They've got the, they call Mary the mother of God. And she's basically the new queen of heaven because they'll call her the mediatrix. She's the go-between. Instead of Jesus Christ being the only mediator be between God and man. They go to, to Mary and they've, they've elevated her basically to a deity status. It's, 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 it's insane what they've done to her. And it's so blasphemous because God is our father, right? The, the God is, is always portrayed as a male figure. And what they're doing here is they're serving the queen of heaven. And they basically just change God, God's gender into, into a woman instead of a man. Now, there's nothing wrong with women or being a woman, okay? I, I'm not saying that, but see, all throughout the Bible, God has laid out an authority structure. And, and that's what you have to understand. It's not, it's not that women are worse or valueless or anything else. They're different functions and different jobs. And see, God has his own specific job that he has. And when you, when you change his gender, you're changing his role and you're putting him more as a submissive one instead of one that's an authority. And, it, and, and these truths are laid out all throughout the Bible where um, you know, the Bible says that the woman should not usurp authority over the man. I mean, that's, that is, that's in the Bible. That's the word of God. Now, a lot of people will bristle at that and say, no, that's not right because they live in this world that says, hey, women's rights and women's lives and everybody's equal and women can do the same things that men can do and men can do the same things that women can do and that there's, nobody should be in charge in the home and that there's two people and you just need to vote and make decisions and all this other stuff it's nonsense that's not what the bible says now people might think that that's what they want to do and that you know well, go ahead do whatever you want to do but don't say that that's not found in the bible don't call god a liar don't call me a liar i'm, I'm just quote i'll quote to you the scriptures i just did and when these people are, are, are worshiping the Queen of Heaven, look who's, look who's doing it, by the way, too. Who is making, who's, who's worshiping the Queen of Heaven? Look at verse number 15. 
Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto the other gods. Notice it doesn't say that the men were burning incense unto the queen of heaven. They just knew that their wives had done it. So these men are not guiltless because they know that their wives had did this. And they're, they're, they're basically answering Jeremiah. But it was their wives. And then it says, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, saying, we will not hearken unto thee. But we're going to do whatever we want to do. And we're going to continue to offer unto the queen of heaven. This is the problem that you get when the man is not the spiritual leader in the home as God has ordained. And that's where these men have failed. They should have been saying, no, you're not going to burn incense under the queen of heaven. We're going to worship the Lord. And in too many homes, the man is not strong-willed. He lets the wife do whatever she wants to do. And, you know, they, they get carried away and they get deceived. See, the Bible says that, um, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Talk about Adam and Eve. <coughs> Adam wasn't tricked. In the Garden of Eden, Eve was deceived by the serpent. When, when the serpent lied to her, he tricked her. See, Adam wasn't deceived. Adam knew he wasn't supposed to do it, but he saw that his wife had done it, and he just did it anyways. He sinned. He knew it was wrong. He wasn't tricked, but he did it anyways, and he still sinned. Now, of course, they both sinned. But what, what I'm pointing out there is that I think it's easier, it's easier for women to be deceived and to be tricked than it is for men. And that's... And, I'm sorry, I, it's just the way it is. I, you know, I didn't make men and women the way that they are. God made us the way that we are. And um, there's other scripture. I don't want to get into that in too much detail. There's other scripture that just basically point out the same thing. And there's, it's one of the reasons why God has ordained men to be the authority and to, to make the decisions and, and to be the spiritual leader just because of that fact. Now, there's nothing wrong with a woman. You know, there's, there's reasons for that with the nurturing and, and the, um, the compassion and the empathy and all the things that women have that are innate in them, it, unfortunately, it, it also <coughs> leads them to also being more vulnerable to being deceived. Okay? But that's just the way it is. Um, and I'm not going to go any further into that this time. We're going to continue on with this chapter. It says, these people had basically the worst attitude that you can have when you're confronted with your sin. Because what they did is just, they completely just said, whatever we say, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to do whatever it is that we want to do. We don't care what God says. We don't care what you says. We're going to continue doing this, offering biddles on the queen of heaven. We're going we're to keep offering, burning incense on the queen of heaven. We're going to do whatever it is that we want to do. And notice their faulty logic, too, because they say, well, when we stopped burning incense on the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings on her, basically saying, then the bad things started to happen. See, we were just fine. We were just fine when we were still offering it. We were still worshiping. When we were doing all that stuff, hey, everything was going great, but as soon as we stopped, that's when the problems happened. They don't even realize that, no, it's because of that. It's exactly because you stopped doing that. That's why you had the trouble. And, and um, look at verse 20 of chapter 44. It says, Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them, and came it not into his mind, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings, and because of the abominations which ye have committed? Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Because ye have burned incense, and because ye have sinned against the Lord, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil has happened unto you as at this day. They're thinking that bad things happen because they stopped. And then for what? It's a faulty memory. Because that's why it came upon them. Now they might have stopped doing it because they finally, you know, all this stuff is happening. But see, one quick point. It's also not a good thing to see how are things going just immediately like right now in your life and just say, well, God must not want me to do this. So like they brought this judgment of God on them and it had to be carried out, right? Because of all the wickedness that they had done. So if after they get decimated like this, they stop worshiping the queen of heaven, but things continue to go bad, like 
Well, God's judgment is still probably being carried out from what you've already done in the past. Don't just look at that and say, oh, well, we must, we must not be doing this. Now we've got to go back to, you know, going back to this other thing and just making those quick, hasty judgments um, based on just your circumstances around you. Okay, don't base it on your circumstances. Base it on what God said. Just base it on what the Bible says because you can't always know the reasons why you're going through hard times, why bad things are happening to you, but you can know that if you're doing what the Bible says and what God has said for you to do, then you're doing the right thing. Regardless of what's happening around you, don't base circumstance, don't let circumstances make you, you know, form, make the decision based on your circumstances. You know what I mean? Like, when things start happening to you, let's say you've never been out sewing before, and you've never done the talking, and then you, you start doing that, you start putting the time in, and then, like, things start happening bad in your life for some reason, don't just think, like, oh, well, God must not want me to do this, and I'm just going to stop. You know what I mean? Because the Bible says you're supposed to do that. And that, that might be a silly example. It might not be. I don't know. But it, it's just an illustration. You can apply it to anything. I mean, when you're doing what God says you're supposed to be doing, if something bad happens or if you start receiving, you know, some persecution from people because you've changed something about your life, don't let that dictate what you're going to do going forward. Just know and be established in your heart what God has said and just continue to, continue to do what, what you know is right from the Bible regardless of the circumstances. Now, um, we have a multitude of people that are serving other gods in this country, and God's attitude still hasn't changed about this. And this is one of the reasons why preachers preach the way they do. This is why I preach the way they do. Go ahead, if you would, please, and turn to Ezekiel chapter 6. We're going to be done in the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Ezekiel is just the next book over from Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 6. Because this is going to... This is, um, I'm going to read a little bit. While you're turning to Ezekiel 6, I'll read for you from Isaiah 58, verse 1. The Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This is the job, this is one of the jobs of the preacher. Okay, God was telling Isaiah, he said, look, cry aloud, spare not, don't hold back. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. This is why I do some yelling while I preach. This is why I'm not just up here speaking calmly the entire time. It's because God is saying, look, lift up your voice like a trumpet. This is important. Show my people their sins. Show them their transgressions. It's got to sink down. It's got to sink in. And we have to realize this. This is serious. God's word is serious. This is not something that's a joke. God's given us a warning. And he's given us pastors and preachers to be messengers of God's word. And say, look, pay attention to this. This is something we need to pay attention to. Look at Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 10. Another admonition for the preacher. Verse number 10. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. Thus saith the Lord God, smite with thine hand, and stomp with thy foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel. For they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. And he that is far off shall die of the pestilence, and he that is near shall fall by the sword, and he that remaineth and is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus will I accomplish my fury upon them. These are serious messages, okay? And when we sin, and this is why, you know, I try not to hold back how bad sin is and what things are sin in your life because God treats them seriously. I mean, you don't want to have God's judgment coming upon you. You, you don't. I mean, nobody does. Everyone will probably agree with that. I don't want God's judgment coming upon me. But you have to realize that when you harden your neck, you harden your heart, you're not receptive to God's word, you don't want to change, you don't want to do what's right, it's going to come. And this is why I preach the way I do, because I'm trying to warn you, trying to show you, look, this is serious. I don't, it's not, it's not just, you know, I'm not just doing this because I'm bored and I have nothing else to do with my time. It's because I'm trying to warn you from God what he has for us, and that there's, there is a, a judgment associated with that. Now, we've already been told that many people aren't going to want to listen to this, but that shouldn't be an excuse for us to back down from preaching what's right. Just because some people don't want to hear it doesn't mean you just, you just okay, well, I'm not going to preach it then. Um, as I alluded to this earlier, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. It means just tell us a story. We don't want to hear what's right. 
And it's the same exact thing that happens in Isaiah chapter 30. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. We're almost done. I'm going to close with this. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 8. The Bible reads, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, the seers, the prophet, the preacher, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. So many people today, they don't want to be told the truth. They don't want to be told what, what God actually says and what the Bible actually says. They just said, make it smooth. Hey, I come in this morning, I want to leave feeling good. Speak, speak something, speak something nice to me. Speak something smooth. Hey, I don't care if you have to lie. Tell me a lie. Just make it a good lie. Make it, make it something that's going to make me happy. And that's exactly what people like Joel Osteen are doing. They're, just, they're up there, and, and it's for filthy lucre's sake. It's just because of the love of money. They're just going to lie to people. And you know what? That's why he has these huge mega churches where he can fill up a coliseum. Because there's so many people out there, they just want to hear, they just want to be lied to. They just want to be told, hey, I go in, I leave, I'm feeling good, and I'm going great, and that's my dose for the week, and I'm going to come back next week, and, I, and, you know, and the preacher man is going to make me just feel good. The guy never talks about anything negative ever. Do you think that anybody's growing or changing in that church? Absolutely not. It's the, you, have to, you have to be told, in order to change something in your life, you have to be told something's wrong. I mean, why would you change anything if you didn't think anything's wrong? If you think everything is right in your life, why would you make a change? You're doing great. You're doing fantastic. We need to understand that some of the things that we're doing are wrong. In order to change that, and when we understand God's attitude about it, and how serious it is about it, and the judgment that he brings upon it, God's angry with the wicked every day. Okay, God's angry with our sin. He doesn't want us doing it. He made the commandments for a reason. We need to have a humble heart and just accept the rebuke. And just, and just be willing to change. Recognize what we're doing. Don't, don't make up the excuses. Don't just pawn it off. And don't, don't put pass the buck and pass the blame on somebody else. Just own up to it and say, you know what? If this is what the Bible says, I'm interested in the truth. I'm interested in what God has for me. I'm just going to do it. And, you know, we can't control what other people's hearts are like. I can't control how you're going to react or how anybody is. But you can have control over your own heart. And this is the whole point of the sermon today. You know, it's not, it's, 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 you know, the people in Jeremiah's day, they did what they did. They reacted the way they did. But don't allow yourself to become like one of those people. Don't harden your heart. You know, nobody likes to be rebuked. Nobody does. It's not pleasant. I mean, you like to think that everything you're doing is just fine and you're doing well. Of course. That's, I mean, that goes without saying. But when, when, when you're shown something, when you're shown that you're wrong, and, and, it, and it legitimately is from the Bible, I mean, when it's God's word, recognize it as such. And don't, and don't try to just pause it, pass it off and say, well, that's not really what the Bible's saying. I mean, it, it says what it says. Be honest with yourself. Be honest in your heart and, and have a humble heart and um, be able to receive instruction from God. Let's bow right to a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the instruction that you've given us. God, I pray that you would please help us not to have stiff necks, dear God, and, not, and, and also not to succumb to the brainwashing of this world where we have some preconceived ideas in our, in our heads and our hearts, Lord, so that when we come to you and we want to know what you'd have us to do, that we don't just resist you and resist the truth and just want to do whatever it is that we've conjured up in our own minds or in our own hearts, dear Lord, but that we would just, just simply obey what you have for us to do. You have not made things that difficult for us, dear Lord. Um, you love us, and we know this, and that um, the rules that you have for us are for our own benefit. They're, they're not to punish us, dear Lord, and um, help us to understand that. Help us to just to have a humble and a meek spirit so that we don't constantly fight and strive against you when we're rebuked. Help us to be able to just, to just not answer again and just, just hear your word and make the changes. We all have sin in our life, dear God. Nobody is perfect. Absolutely nobody here is perfect. We all have areas to improve. God, I pray that you would please help us
to see these things. Dear God, help me to preach the things that, that people need to hear. Lord, I don't want to hold anything back. I want everybody to grow here. Um, and, and I pray that you please open up the things for myself as well through your word that I need to change in my life. God, make it apparent to us and help us to be humble in heart to receive your word and to, and to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.